Are they going to do it anyway? Uh, <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and good afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And I'm very pleased to welcome you here this afternoon on behalf of the Ford School and the Department of Economics. Um, let me first recognize my co-host for this afternoon's event. Uh, Linda Tsar is the chair of the Department of Economics. And Linda and I are extremely grateful to have such distinguished experts with us here today to share their insights on what's clearly the dominant policy topic. Um, the crisis in the economy. As you all know, we've been in the midst of a very severe recession. The financial turmoil that began here in the United States in late 2007 contracted credit, slashed wealth, undermined confidence, and during 2008 snowballed to economies around the world. These conditions prompted unprecedented monetary and fiscal policy actions in the U.S. as well as in many other countries. The data now suggest, however, that the situation has not only eased, but that the recession may be ending. There, of course, remains a tremendous amount of uncertainty about where things really stand, about how the U.S. and the rest of the world economies are likely to evolve, and what could and should be done to move us most effectively towards recovery and to pre prevent future crises. So in that context, we have asked our panelists to launch a forward-looking discussion that emphasizes the role for policy. Um, we've asked our experts to each first take a few minutes to share with you their views about the current macroeconomic situation with a particular focus on policy measures that they believe ought now to be taken to stabilize the economy and to restore robust growth. Following their introductory remarks, we'll have perhaps 30 minutes for dialogue among the panelists and for a question and answer session with the audience. So with much to accomplish in just the 80 minutes or so that we have for this event, I'm going to ask the panelists to pardon me for, in advance for introducing them not nearly as fully as their accomplishments would warrant. We have distributed more complete bios, however, and so let me just briefly both welcome and introduce our speakers. We're going to go in reverse alphabetical order this afternoon, and so our first panelist will be um, Alan Sinai, who is an alumnus of the Department of Economics and a very good friend to the Ford School. Alan co-founded Decision Economics, Inc., a global economics and financial market information support and advisory firm that serves financial institutions, corporations, governments, and individuals around the world. Our second panelist will be our colleague Matthew Shapiro, who is the Lawrence R. Klein Collegiate Professor of Economics and a research professor here at the University of Michigan. Next, we'll hear from Charles Evans, the ninth president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. We're very honored to have Charlie with us here today. These are obviously extremely busy times for the Federal Reserve, and we're quite grateful he could join us. And last but not least, our final speaker will be Peter Borish, who is a distinguished alumnus of both the Ford School and the Department of Economics. Peter founded the Computer Trading Corporation, an actively managed hedge fund that focuses on macroeconomic investing. So on behalf of the Ford School and the Economics Department, I couldn't be more pleased to welcome these four panelists to the University of Michigan. Um, please join me in giving them a combined welcome before we invite Alan to this podium. Thanks very much. Uh, it's good to see so many uh, Michigan people here and a few people not from Michigan. Uh, the economy and recovery risks problems and policies for the short and uh, long run. Those are, uh, that's the title of uh, my brief remarks uh, this afternoon. Uh, the U.S. and global economies, uh, we think, are in a recovery. A year ago, it looked quite grim. Recovery doesn't mean health. Recovery has a technical meaning in economics and business cycle parlance. And I'll get to a kind of recovery in a few moments. Most likely, but not for sure, it will be sustained and, sustain, and will be sustainable. But there remain big risks and problems that are cause for considerable concern. Risks and potential problems that macroeconomic policies and policy makers should guard against. Uh, these risks and problems include uh, sustaining uh, the recovery, what we have going, joblessness, which I think is going to be the number one public policy problem uh, over the next year and perhaps a lot longer. The consumer, the ability to spend and save. Federal budget deficits and debt, 
the record deficits, record debt to GDP is the direction we're headed in. Appropriate exit plans for returning monetary policy to a more normal state and fiscal policy to less government involvement and less deficits. And uh, the appropriate mix and policies for the short and longer term to get the economy headed toward, and this now seems a long way away, full employment, maximum growth, price and financial stability. Full employment for me is 4% unemployment rate. I do believe there are sets of policies that can get us there and uh, get us there at a non-inflationary situation. We're at 9.8%. Uh, we've gotten to 9.8% very fast, so 4% is a long way away, and will occupy policymakers and all of us for unfortunately too many years. Make no mistake about it, although far from perfect, the emergency and aggressive Washington policy actions over the past two years, both monetary and fiscal, uh, have made a big difference. There would be no recovery now. And the Great Recession, which we are calling this episode, the deepest and longest since the 1930s that we had, um, might have been a mini depression or something more like the 1930s than a phrase like the Great Recession connotes. The zero interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve and some other central banks and quantitative easing by our central bank with support from the Treasury helped to keep credit functioning and staved off the panic and flight to safety by investors and managed to keep uh, our financial institutions, uh, most of them, going. Also, uh, uh, that would have, if uh, not for the actions of the Federal Reserve, intensified, led to intensification of the downturn. Households and businesses would have cut back more. That would have caused more failed institutions, problems, and credit. Markets would have kept tumbling, and the economy as well. The fiscal stimulus of the federal government, we've had two programs, $2,862 billion, 2009, February, $787 billion. While short on bang for a buck has helped, and uh, government programs to support mortgage finance, housing, states, individuals with transfer payments and income support and outright federal government purchases Keynesian-like on public spending to take the place of depressed private sector spending. Still not fully implemented, uh, that program is having significant positive effects. Now the task is to use existing policies and devise new ones to make sure the recovery is sustained and to put the economy on a track toward full employment, uh, while at the same time working our huge federal budget deficits down to more manageable proportions. It's not an easy task. Uh, we need to remember that every time the U.S. and almost any country has had a jobs and unemployment problem, what I am calling public enemy number one, uh, strong and dynamic real economic growth, that is aggregate demand, and macroeconomic policies to promote growth ultimately have been the solution. It's not to say that labor market policies, micro policies, governance, education and training, supply side uh, incentives are, are not effective. It's just a comment about the relative magnitude. If you look at where we have had full employment, it's always been when we've had very strong growth for a long time, and behind it has been aggressive, stimulative macroeconomic policies of some sort. Whether it was uh, full employment post the 1930s, the latter half of the 1960s, the golden decade of the 1990s, and for a short time this decade uh, during 2007. Well, let me make a few comments on the recovery uh, and then some of the risks and the problems. I'm not going to deal with all the problems, only one or two, mainly the jobless problem, uh, and uh, a few uh, perspectives on the policy. Uh, the economy seems to have entered some sort of recovery. I say it that way because I don't want you to get all excited about this recovery, especially since I think this is going to be the parents, the parent or parents of all the jobless recoveries. You notice I looked at the audience when I said that. There are slightly more females and males in the room. You can check that count later on, but I think I'm right. And so I can't call it the mother of all jobless recoveries. And yesterday I did call it the father 
of all Java's recoveries, and I got booed for that one. <laughs> so I don't know quite what to say. But the point is, this is, uh, I think, associated with this recovery is going to be a very high, higher than we have now unemployment rate, sticky high unemployment rate, and a tremendous uh, army or pool of unemployed uh, workers. Well, we have recovery. Uh, this came after the longest 22 months or so, if the MBER dates it uh, uh, sometime around the last month or so, and deepest 4% on a real GDP basis peaked the trough. Biggest downturn since the 1930s, the longest. How do, how do we know we're in recovery? The high frequency indicator data with only a few, although notable exceptions, it's the jobs data. Uh, down cycles, um, uh, they suggest the beginning of an upturn. Down cycles in housing, consumption, and business capital spending have ended and some are turning up, and the lagged effects of massively easier monetary policy and a huge fiscal stimulus are positively impact, and hopefully more so in 2010. The brunt of the fiscal stimulus of the $787 billion program of this past February really should hit in 2010. It is a two-year program, so there are some issues about 2011 and 2012, and for that reason, we are looking at this recovery, and then we think it'll be an expansion as a three to five year uh, unless other things change, three to five year cycle, up cycle in the US, that's not very long, historically speaking. The 90s were a decade, and even this last uh, up cycle was seven years. Three to five is on the short side. I hope uh, that will change uh, with events. What kind of recovery? What's the prospect? Well, it's easiest to use alphabet letters, though scientifically inappropriate, uh, here at a university to describe uh, the uh, look. For us, uh, the picture for, and this is for real GDP, it's a summary measure of the economy, up tilted L. So from your direction, I think it's that. Uh, and the up tilt is at the bottom. That says it's anemic. And anemic means uh, we think we're growing, uh, th we grew 3.5% in the third quarter. We're going to slow down because of a slowdown in consumer spending in the fourth quarter. That may scare people, 1.5%. And then uh, 2 to 4% uh, up and down over the uh, next year, uh, averaging something on the order of 25 to 3%. Uh, that's OK. But in fact, it's better for the first year than post-2001 and post-1990-91. But it's far, far less than the median first year recovery upturn uh, after 10 post-World War II recessions. Uh, where the uh, average or the median uh, GDP, real GDP growth rate was 6.7%. So it's 40% of the typical upturn on a GDP basis. The typical upturn is described as a V. We give that one chance in 10. Uh, the up till the L, we give it about two thirds times. Uh, the V is typically powered by pent up consumption demands, easy money, lots of credit, uh, with autos, housing, and consumption up sharply. That then causes business to produce and to build inventories, and we get a big move in inventories. And usually, uh, we're getting some help from the government as well uh, in one form or another, uh, and that's, that's the typical V. This time, uh, we think the consumer has no power. Uh, this is very negative. This is very different. This is a seismic shift, in, in our view, that started several years ago for the American consumer. And uh, uh, the fundamentals around the consumer look very negative, ranging from income to uh, wealth, the lack thereof, inability to get funds, and therefore not spending. So the new normal for the economy uh, is going to be the new trend rate of growth for consumption. It isn't going to be anywhere near it was in the past, 3.5% a year inflation adjusted. It may only be around 2%, and the economy is therefore doomed to a slow growth rate. That then suggests that business, which is, in the, is not in the mood to hire anyway for various reasons, will not see enough demand domestically to do a lot of hiring, and we have an adverse feedback loop. Less hiring, less income, growing pool of labor, less income, less spending, business hiring less, and that loop is going to keep us at a low rate and produce a big problem and big risk. The risk is the consumer. The risk of a double dip recession is the consumer. And the public policy problem, number one, is an unemployment rate going above 10%, which understates unemployment, a huge pool of labor, uh, and uh, a political and economic problem that we have not seen, I think, since the 1930s. So what do policymakers do about this? 
policymakers already, at least where I was yesterday, the Democrats in Congress, leadership already worried about joblessness and thinking about measures, not a big $800 billion stimulus program, but measures that could do something at the margin for the jobless program, a problem. Uh, we won't see major policy thrust on this uh, from the administration until next year. There are a lot of things that can be done, but uh, the, the curve, the dynamics of the uh, joblessness uh, and, and how it interacts with policy, uh, when policy gets behind the curve of what goes on dynamically, policy tends to be too late and you're stuck uh, with the problem. For the policy uh, and exit plan, which is a second big problem and issue, how do the policymakers exit from the tremendous amount of help that they have provided to get the economy into this state? My answer is, I don't think I care much about exit plans at this point if the diagnosis of the risk and the problem of unemployment is what I describe as the prospect. Federal Reserve should stay the course where it is. Uh, with this kind of unemployment, standard uh, inflation paradigms would not suggest that we're going to have any inflation problem soon. And if the goals are maximum sustainable growth, full employment, and price stability, uh, they don't have to worry about the price stability uh, at this point. So they should continue with the low interest rate policy to provide credit to the system until the system can on its own provide credit. And I think it's very straightforward. On fiscal policy, it's not so easy because any measures that will be taken in Washington will cost money. And money means a higher deficit. They're scared to death down in Washington, the Democrats are, on the budget deficits. They should be, it's a horrible potential issue. But you know, and the trade-off between accepting higher budget deficits and the kind of jobless problem and so little risk to inflation, for me it's a no-brainer. We need to accept higher deficits and worry about taking them down over the longer term with an appropriate set of policies uh, and not accept in policy making the kind of unemployment problem that we are already launched into and probably will continue to see. Thanks. I find myself sandwiched between a distinguished uh, forecaster and uh, an actual policymaker, and I'm a little reluctant to uh, to tell them their own business. But of course, I'm a professor, so that that, <laughs> that, that, that entitles me. Uh, so I want to actually uh, start off where uh, Alan uh, Alan left th this question of uh, exit strategy, and particularly focus on 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 the Federal Reserve exit strategy from. Uh, from the from its current uh, uh, current policy stance, uh, so let me just elaborate a little more what the stance is. Uh, interest rates uh, are, are zero to a quarter percent, and they've been uh, been there for a considerable period. And I agree with Alan that the Federal Reserve is likely uh, to keep them low for a considerable period of time. Given the amount of slack in the economy, if if you look at our models, uh, the interest rate would really like to be lower, but. Zero, uh, you, you can't, that's a technical problem, making a negative interest rate. And that explains why the Fed, I, quite successfully in my eyes, has done this uh, non-conventional monetary policy, essentially buying up assets other than short-term treasuries, which they normally operate in to push down the interest rates, uh, to directly provide credit to the economy. And I, and, I, and I agree with Alan that this has been uh, an extremely successful policy. Maybe, maybe I would have done it a little differently uh, in timing and in detail. Uh, but uh, has essentially saved us uh, from the brink of the, of the next great, uh, great Depression. And where it looks now is we have a, a glide path uh, that looks good, uh, but by no means great. Uh, sustained growth in the 3% range is basically what it will take to keep unemployment rate constant. We need more, uh, more rapid economic growth than the potential growth of the economy to get unemployment to fall, and, and no one is, is forecasting that. And it's very hard uh, uh, to know where that forecast was, would come from. Uh, Alan's, Alan's a little more optimistic than I am. I'm more pessimistic. But it's, it's hard. It's, very, it's, a, it's pretty easy uh, to think of reasons why the, the, the path might be, uh, uh, might be worse. 
uh, we could get the double dip from the consumers, there could be other shoes to drop, drop financially, many of the problems in the banks are not fully worked out, uh, perhaps uh, this virtuous expectational equilibrium that we're in now relative to six months ago in March uh, could turn around, expectations can move on a dime, all those things argue towards uh, risks to the forecast. It's very hard to think of something uh, that will get us a lot more growth uh, than, than is currently expected. So uh, uh, I'm, uh, with, with maybe a little more down tone, basically saying the same thing Al Alan is, that the, uh, we, we, it's very hard to see how uh, unemployment is going to fall much in the near future. But eventually, eventually it will uh, if, we're on, if we're on this virtual path, uh, virtuous path. And then how does the, how does the Fed uh, get out of this uh, uh, situation. Now I'm going to start telling uh, President Evans his, 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 his business, and I'll be interested to see what, what he has to say about this. Uh, so at some point in the uh, nearish future, uh, if the economy recovers uh, as we expect, the Fed is going to have to start to think about raising interest rates, get, getting it off zero. And what should it be thinking about, and when should it be thinking, thinking about it? And um, I agree with Alan that inflation is very well contained. Uh, it's very hard to see how inflation is going to pick up for a variety of reasons. One, there's a huge gap uh, which puts downward pressure on inflation. Secondly, there's a great deal of confidence in the Fed's ability to contain inflation. And that contains inflation expectations. So uh, it, it would be very hard to see how inflation could get going in this environment. And that, that leaves the Fed substantial room for keeping interest rates low for a considerable period. Uh, I want to say that that, uh, that is in some ways a good position to be in. Uh, certainly uh, not having to think about raising interest rates uh, uh, next, uh, next year is uh, where, where you would want to be as a policymaker with unemployment so high. But it does, uh, does create some risks. And, by, uh, and to, the, and to, uh, to explain what I mean, I just want, you don't have to think back very far. This has somewhat of the feel of the earlier part of this decade when the interest, rate, when interest rates were kept low for a sustainable period uh, in response to the, to the previous asset market bulk, uh, meltdown. Here, we're, here we have the housing meltdown, which created all these financial problems. Uh, previously, we had the internet uh, meltdown. It didn't have the financial spillovers, but nonetheless, the, kept, the Fed kept interest rates low for a sustainable period. Why did it do that? It was actually... Uh, first afraid that prices would fall, and then uh, kept interest rates low for longer than it might have uh, because inflation was well contained, and, 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 indeed, and indeed it remained so. But that, keeping interest rates low for a long period uh, can have some adverse side effects. Uh, you're providing lots of liquidity to banks. Uh, bankers uh, get creative when they have lots of liquidity. Uh, in 2003, I refinanced my mortgage and had, had a perfectly fine uh, uh, rate, thank you. Uh, 2004, 2005, most of the good risks had, had uh, refinanced and the bankers started looking creatively uh, for others to lend to and they had the wherewithal to do it uh, because interest rates were very low and the Fed was providing an assurance that they remain low for the foreseeable future and bank, the banks would get ample warning uh, when, when, the, when the course of policy changed. That, that policy at the time was completely justified by the fact that inflation was well contained and the economy uh, was humming along. Uh, uh, although I don't want to uh, 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 put, uh, uh, there's a lot of blame to go around <laughs> uh, for what happened. And uh, low interest rates are probably pretty far down uh, on the list of blame for, blame for the financial crisis. But it was an element of enabling the financial crisis. And it's one I think the Fed is going to have to worry about independently of what's happening to inflation, which is going to be well contained for the next couple of years. So the Fed might, cr might be facing a, a, a problem uh, in, say, the middle of next year or the, to the middle of the following year of having to want to raise interest rates, not because inflation is high, uh, but because uh, the economy is getting frothy, uh, frothy again because of the expectation of essentially zero interest rates. Uh, what can it do not to sort of face that, that difficulty? Uh, 
And there, there the answer is I have to put on uh, the microeconomics hat. Uh, we really have to do something about regulation, which is the other big, in fact, <laughs> macroeconomic uh, item on the agenda now. Uh, so there are many proposals for improving the financial regulatory system. Uh, basically, a lot, uh, basically there, there are many proposals, we can discuss them in greater detail, but part of, part of what caused the crisis, and certainly a, a more important cause, was uh, the fact that basically uh, many, many loans, which shouldn't have been made uh, on, on prudent, prudential grounds, were made. You might say, fine, that's just people's private business, but when they all blow up together, it's the public business, and precisely, we precisely had to have these bailouts uh, because of uh, a combination of excess of credit uh, going on in the, in the middle of this decade. And that was certainly abated by having interest rates too low and, in my view, uh, too long. And that, that could go on again unless, of course, uh, we have it, these various proposals for financial reform, such as increasing capital requirements, more scrutiny of uh, financial organizations, uh, and, and so on. So I think it's very important uh, that, that microeconomics and macroeconomics go hand in hand in, 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 this, in this recovery. And though, though it's quite important for reasons Alan highlighted to keep interest rates low for a sustained period, the Fed's ability to do that will be uh, much, much uh, stronger if we get the kind of uh, prudential regulation, increased capital requirements uh, that have been proposed. So. Well, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I spent a uh, very nice semester here back in the fall of 1999, and it's always a pleasure to come back um, and speak. Now, in my current um, speaker position, I figured I would face a bit of a challenge because we have some uh, noted forecasters and uh, macroeconomic academic experts and markets experts, and so I wasn't quite sure um, I didn't want to duplicate too much on this, so I'll be very light on forecast numbers. Um, I will say that Alan Sinai had perhaps the best alphabetic description of the economic outlook. I have heard about V's, U's, W's, double dips, L's. I've even heard some people talk about check marks, which sounds good, but doesn't quite describe it because the expansion's longer than the downturn. Sometimes it'll say swoosh, but up-tilted L <laughs> does seem to capture things. Um, my, own, my own outlook is, uh, you know, for the economy uh, to grow at about 3% over the next 18 months, it'll be probably uneven on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, and there will be different drivers for different parts of that 18-month uh, time period. But I certainly agree that a big challenge facing all of us will be the very high unemployment rate and the uh, job market. The unemployment rate almost very, very likely to go above 10 percent, maybe just a little bit above 10, and then it's going to be a slow retreat from there, and that's not going to feel like a recovery for quite some time. And in terms of inflation, I'm looking for underlying inflation, which I would measure by core PCE, to be somewhere around one and a half percent for the next couple of years and that's below the inflation rate that I find uh, consistent with the price stability objective that we have. That's my own assessment and I would put that at about two percent. So uh, one and a half is uh, less than that. Um, so I thought I would talk about the policy situation. Everybody's talking about it, but at least I get to speak with the authority of somebody who's been there um, in the room. And I would say that the, the, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate from Congress. That is, we are supposed to support financial conditions which give rise to uh, maximum employment, which we often interpret as sustainable economic growth, and price stability, which I would say is on the order of 2% uh, for inflation. And, you know, both of those are below these, these guidelines. The unemployment rate at 10 percent is uh, unacceptable. Um, I could differ on an assessment of what the natural rate is. I wouldn't put it at 4 percent. I'd put it at much closer to 5 percent and maybe even higher. There could even be some 
more recent structural reasons why it's a little bit above that, but that's not worth talking about those differences during the current period. And, and inflation is relatively low. So both of those are um, indicating uh, policy accommodation and current policy is very accommodative. Certainly in the sense that uh, the federal funds rate is about zero, it's close to zero as you can uh, get. <laughs> and we've put in place non-traditional policy measures by purchasing uh, agency mortgage-backed securities, agency debt, additional treasuries. Our balance sheet has grown. Our purchases have been on the order of $2 trillion in addition to the additional lending facilities that we have put in place to support uh, credit origination, uh, asset-backed securities markets, and, and, and the banking system more generally. So one of the questions, which I won't answer today, but I think it's worth asking, is when the policy situation is relatively unambiguous in terms of calling for policy accommodation, how is it going to play out as we move from something that's unambiguous to something which exhibits shades of gray in terms of what the risk characteristics are, and then to an ultimate policy path where uh, we have to begin exiting from our current policy accommodation, and how aggressive will that path be? Um, I would have said when we first began our non-traditional policies that it would be relatively easy to see when accommodation was about to be removed because I originally thought that as we increased our balance sheet, we would have to reduce our balance sheet in order to provide more restrictive uh, credit policies. But in fact, we have studied uh, many different ways, many different tools to provide uh, policy restraint. And you know, now I tend to think that by offering interest on excess reserves, the banking system has a large number of excess reserves. In order to uh, move to anything which is restrictive, we would have to put pressure on those reserves. And we could do that through raising interest on excess reserves. And so we could do that hand in hand with our balance sheet still being on the sizable side. But as we move towards neutral, I'm not quite so sure that still begins to work. So I think there will be a progression. And it, I had originally thought it would be very easy to see this because we would have to work down our balance sheet. But in fact, it's probably not going to be quite so apparent. Um, now, in terms of inflation, I would say that our exit, um, exiting from policy accommodation, well, we have to balance off the, the, the economic situation. But I'm just going to take as given the fact that the unemployment rate is going to be high uh, for an extended period of time. So the question is, at what point do inflationary pressures or inflationary concerns sort of lead you to want to balance out our, our policy stance? And so that's going to depend on the evolution of inflation. That will depend on inflation expectations and how the economy is responding in terms of uh, resource costs and uh, how firms are marking up prices, what wages are doing. And that's uh, pretty well correlated with resource slack. So that's back to sort of the labor situation. So I find myself constantly thinking about arguments that I've heard in terms of how important is resource slack for inflationary pressures versus how important are changes in inflation expectations. Um, I think that resource slack is a, big, is, a, is a big factor for inflation determination. In fact, it's sort of taken as given in intermediate macro the way we currently uh, think about it. But we also, but, but there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, certainly Atanasios Orfanides has written about the 1970s, which you could look at the U.S. economic experience with high unemployment rates and kind of say, there must be a lot of slack out there. But in fact, there were a lot of structural changes going on in the United States, and the unemployment rate and the labor markets were um, more consistent with higher natural rates of unemployment there. And so I think that's something that you would normally have to be concerned about, making sure that what you identify as slack resources in the economy are, in fact, slack. But even if I think the natural rate is 5 percent, or even if it's 6 percent because of certain reallocation stories that might be evident now, with an unemployment rate of 10 percent, it's just a very large factor in the inflation situation. So as I said, my own forecast is for inflation to be more along the lines of 1.5 percent for the next couple of years in the face of uh, this type of slack. But it is a case that we, have to, we must pay attention to all of the inflationary pressures. That's my viewpoint. 
that it's not going to be an issue, but we, we have to monitor that. So inflation expectations are really important, and we have to think about that. Now, inflation expectations are also unobservable. A lot of people sort of point at, you know, resource slack, output gaps, Phillips curves. They embody unobservable variables, and that's true. But inflation expectations are not really any more observable than any type of resource slack. Yes, there are survey measures of inflation expectations, and a very important one is produced here at the University of Michigan. We look at it very carefully. Um, and there are all kinds of ways that that data, as I understand it, when it's collected very scientifically, still needs some type of massaging in order to take care of outliers and, and things like that. So um, as good as it gets, it's still one measure of expectations. And then there are market measures from the uh, tips market and those could be pretty good, but they also do suffer from certain market difficulties when there are liquidity or risk spreads. And in fact, last fall we saw uh, lots of those pressures in all markets, and so it's very important that we have to um, handle those. And even when we get that right, as if that wasn't hard enough, the levels of these inflation expectations don't quite correspond to what I would say is an acceptable inflation rate. When I look at longer term uh, mission University of Michigan inflation expectations, I think it's on the order of two and three quarters to three percent. And I just said that I think the two percent is most consistent with price stability. And so I don't think that's a lack of credibility of monetary policy, but I am mindful of that um, if inflation were to sort of begin to rise to those levels. <clears throat> But I think there's a level issue that you have to deal with. So all I'm trying to say here is that inflation expectations are um, important, tough to measure. We have to work hard at it, and we have to scrutinize them very carefully. But they are important because, as we point to other risk factors in our balance sheet, we've grown our balance sheet quite substantially, um, and the monetary base has grown a lot. And we know that money is a monetary phenomenon, uh, eventually, not quarter to quarter, not month to month. Um, so we have to be paying attention to that. And if money is an important driving factor of increasing inflation, I would expect that to show up in higher inflationary expectations. The same would go if fiscal issues were uh, very important there. Uh, and also if there was a, uh, concerns about the credible policy that we could follow through in the face of difficult decision making when the unemployment rate is high. So inflationary expectations are really important. So I guess my bottom line is, I still see expectations as stable, and there's a lot of slack out there that's meaningful. So at the moment, I do tend to agree with the uh, perspectives raised before that um, you know, we have to think about our exit policy, and we are looking at it very carefully, but um, you know, at the moment, that's not our first order concern. At the moment, it's the policy accommodation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, I can understand why, uh, probably speaking last, I think I'm going to take a little bit different uh, tact here. And uh, just sort of thinking of the analogy a little bit, just let's say that the Fed did a tremendous job as storm chasers going into a hurricane. And we're in the eye of the hurricane right now. The weather looks great. Everybody's happy. When that plane hits the other side, it is not going to be pretty. So a year ago, I was standing here, and I, it was actually the day that Congress, for the House, the second time, passed the TARP. And I was scared to death of what was going to happen in the markets, and that was going to lead the economy now. Today, I'm scared to death of what's going to happen in the economy and how that's going to affect uh, the markets afterwards. So there's a, a little bit different causal effect. So when you look at this, and I'll try to try to keep it brief within uh, eight minutes. So where are we? Just a show of hands. How many people think that the dollar is at an all-time low and just in the worst shape ever? Did I just see the show of hands there? Nobody has an opinion? <laughs> or everybody reads the paper every day, but they don't, they don't follow it. OK, so where we are is we've done a little bit of a mini pre-2008, right? The correlations in all the markets are the same, except 
The euro is at 150, it was at 160 then, but the world is coming to an end, right? Gold is strong, just as it was then. It's $20 difference, and oh, by the way, gold is $30 higher than it was at its peak in 1980. So everybody that held gold for all those gold bulls, let's throw a party. You, you made your money back after all these years. I think it's fantastic, right? <laughs> the Dow is back to 10,000. I think that that's great too, except when was the first time the Dow was at 10,000? March of 1999. So I have an 18-year-old daughter who's a freshman in college. And in 1999, I thought I was smart. I took $100,000. I invested it. I thought 7% a year. Guess what's going to happen in 10 years? I'm going to double, right? 7% compounded over 10 years. It's really 96, but we'll, we're economists. We can round. <laughs> Guess what happens? It's Michigan's tuition continues to go up. So I have that 200000 in my mind. I'm going to be able to pay for it, except I only have 100000 right now because I'm back to where I was, except I pay for the tuition, room and board and everything else. So now I've got sixty grand left to pay for the next three years. How is that going to work? That is the microcosm of what's going on in the economy, that there's tremendous, tremendous deflationary pressures underneath. I like to say, and I know this is on the record, but uh, so I'm going to say it anyway, that <laughs> state and local government finances are essentially the equivalent, they make Bernie Madoff look legitimate, right? We have a series of legacy health care and pension fund issues that how are they going to be addressed? Why is it that state funding for Michigan continues to go down every year? It can't work. We have a gigantic math problem, and that's why the Fed is in a very, very difficult situation. I hate to be next to the president of the Chicago Fed and talking about this and, you know, obviously in terms of a policy perspective, and I'll get to that in a second. But when you think about it, if, if you're a public service worker, I like to call it, you get 20 and then you get 40, right? If you're a policeman, if you're a fireman, you get to work for 20 years, you come in at 22, you have 20 years, you get a pension. You come out at 42, age expectancy is 82, you get paid for 40 years. How does that math work? How does that work? So then we have record unemployment, and it's going to continue, so we have another math problem, right? So we have a Social Security, we have a Medicare trust fund. We have people who are age-specific, so we have record unemployment for those here who are in college, go to graduate school, <laughs> right? And by the way, it will work, because I graduated in 82, and I got lucky, and I came out, and that was the worst recession, so you're much better off coming out at a low than you were three years ago and getting a job and getting laid off. So stay in it. <laughs> things get better. It's just that's, that's the other side of the math problem. Okay? Then uh, we have record unemployment, and this is the part of age 45 and over. So in your highest earning years when you should be saving and planning for retirement, you have record unemployment. So the demands on social services are quite high, but the replenishing of the coffers are there too. And so politically, and I want to give a tremendous amount of credit to Congress, to the Fed, and there's zero credit. You get zero credit for disaster averted in the political system, right? So everybody says, well, we're okay now. We shouldn't have spent this money. But we don't know where we would have been if we didn't spend that money. I think we would have been a lot worse off. But what makes me nervous, more nervous than I already am, maybe just because of the big crowd, so I'm really nervous, but uh, is the fact that there's already discussions, right? So the first thing that the chairman said, and the first thing that uh, Secretary Geithner said when they testified is, we don't want to make the same mistakes which w uh, that we made in the last time around. And oh, by the way, I love the fact that it was the Great Recession, it's the worst this. We've had four consecutive quarters of negative growth. We may have a positive quarter here, right? And so when you're in the markets, you can't necessarily look backwards, right? The one thing is when you drive, if you continually are looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to run into a light pole. When you manage money, you've got to try to look forward. You have to deal with expectations. So you have one certain path, and then that path going forward is full of uncertainty, and there's likely to be policy mistakes. And the one thing I would come up here, and I want to shout out 
to my friend and my mentor, Ned Gramlich, who was at the Fed at the time in 2005, 2006, talking about predatory lending standards and what was going on. And of all the people, I think, on the Fed at that time, and it's great credit to, to Ned, and who was my professor, and I worked uh, with, but was, and wrote the book, and was on top of that. So it's a credit to this institution. But problems are seeable when it, when it comes to that. So I look at the fact that we've done a many things. All the correlations are the same. The dollar's up, the dollar's down, commodities are up, the equity market is up. We're talking about unwinding policies, but beneath the surface, we have record unemployment in these two different areas, and it's likely to go up. And then if you look at the, the surface beneath, right, people who have stopped looking and everything, it's a, it's a lot worse. So the question is, in terms of a policy perspective, I think there's one thing that we have to do. We have to change the incentives and make labor relatively cheaper compared to capital. Right now, all our policies are geared towards utilizing capital, accelerated depreciation, buy this, right? And everything relative to capital, to labor, is more expensive, right? I live in New York, guess what? I hire somebody, I now have to pay a special MTA tax on them. I'm gonna hire somebody, I'm gonna have to deal with uh, uh, additional healthcare costs. If we have an employment problem, and everything stems from that, and I agree completely, we have to change the incentives to make it better for people to hire workers rather than replace workers with uh, technology. So I'm going to leave it at that, and then we can address uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Before I open the floor up for questions, uh, let me invite any of them who would like to make a brief rejoinder to uh, one of the other comments. Um, Alan. Um, for uh, Charlie, the 4% number was not an assessment of the natural rate. It was uh, a societal goal notion, and the notion behind it is to devise policies that will get us there along with in terms of the natural rate, it being the natural rate at that time, which involves labor market policy as well as macro policy. And the natural rate, uh, actually I'm agnostic, all the empirical work I've done, I've not been able to, 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 uh, to support the, the notion. So theoretically and empirically, I'm an agnostic on that, that issue and suggest to policymakers they ought to be too, because it sometimes get, gets policymakers in trouble to have a uh, a conceptual view if something happens and it doesn't always work that way. The 90s, the 1990s, as an example for monetary policy. We can talk about that later. It's a very interesting episode. The, the, the central bank gave up on the conventional natural rate at that time, and the U.S. economy had a very good decade. But you're thinking about that. So here, one, one for Peter. Well, I don't want to leave the impression that, you know, I'm monolithic and looking at a particular unemployment rate and measuring it against that. Uh, let me ask you to move forward so that they can hear in the microphone. Um, you know, I very much, you know, look at the entire, uh, you know, sweep of the economic data and how that looks. And I, I personally find it useful to have these sort of benchmarks Got so it. that I can kind of say, yeah, that looks high, that looks low. It's sort of a dashboard type of perspective. I, I suppose I agree with you that those things are dynamic. They'll move around over time. So if you fall in love with any one particular indicator, you will easily run into problems. Well, thanks. We're totally on the same page. Peter, our empirical research supports your notion. Uh, that is to say, uh, we just did some recent work in the context of recommending the Social Security tax cuts for businesses and individuals as a policy to create jobs. And uh, we found in our employment equations, so a bit technical, I'm sorry about this, the disaggregate employment equations, that the, uh, the, the employment cost index, which is an employer cost, has a lot of power. And intuitively, I see it all the time, just as your comment is somewhat anecdotal. Business just doesn't want to hire people. They're just too expensive when you roll in all the costs, health care and retirement costs. And, and uh, we, we've had, I think, a, a huge change in the structure of the business cycle the last three post-recessions. And this is one of the major reasons. So totally agree with what you said. If, if Thank I you. Just, just, just briefly, and then we'll open the floor. I just want to ask uh, President Evans a question. I didn't say this 
but I want to, you know, everybody thought that the, or people here, right, think that uh, credit default swaps cost uh, was a major problem. And so what about if we can't beat them, what about joining them? So we, as a U.S. taxpayer, have put a tremendous amount of money into a number of financial institutions. The marketplace obviously loves it, right, because they've all rallied significantly. So why don't we buy CDSs to protect our investment, just as Goldman Sachs would? <laughs> well, I think that confuses. Well, I think, I think that confuses the public policy role that we have versus a private institution, um, you know, requirement to hedge their their risks. Um, you know, the CDS market. I, you know, I would get this question, you know, for for some time in the run up. You know, bef before, well, sort of the summer of 2007, but before things were really evident that there were problems. And it would usually take the form of a question like, the CDS market is $62 trillion. What do you think of that? Stated that way, there's a lot of different ways to respond. I mean, $62 trillion is a notional value of all of these, you know, a $10 million bond, and what's your real risk aspect? So um, we're not very good at understanding you know, sort of gross exposure versus net exposures. And so I think that the proposal to uh, move more towards netting out CDS exposures through clearing mechanisms is a useful one. I agree, but that doesn't answer my question. Well, so, your question was what we should. How do we, we protect should. our taxpayer money? But why don't we protect our taxpayer money in the same way? If we've had this tremendous run-up, if Who's there's a take decline, the position of a CDS well, the market. We buy? If if the market has rallied, if Citibank has rallied from 97 cents to five dollars, right? So you've got a 300 uh, percent increase. So a credit default swap is an arrangement with somebody who basically takes an insurance role. And it just doesn't strike me that from a public policy standpoint, we want private markets to offer insurance when it's actually the government that is more. But our money, as a taxpayer, our, as a taxpayer our money's at risk, though, right? So that's why we have, uh, you know, risk management to look at, you know, our portfolio, the main lane aspects of that. And while, you know, it's the case that at any point in time, some of those assets may not be worth exactly what we paid for them. We have been making money on other forms of lending through interest payments on our program. So the real question is how we come out at the end of all of this. And at the moment, we expect that we'll do fine. But so, that doesn't change the fact that there's risk. With that, why don't we open the floor up if there are additional questions. Um, because we are recording, I will briefly repeat the question and then uh, invite panelists to respond. Um, if there are thoughts, questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. And it, speak loudly, please. I will say if, if we need to lower the unemployment rate, and the, the a nice way to do it is to lower the relative cost of labor, and, then, uh, and we also can assume that generally we want smaller budget deficits in our government, and then why don't we look at nationalizing health insurance to do, use economies of scale to lower the overall spend per doing per person? Because currently we're at $9,000 per person on medical spending, but twice that for second health insurance, we could remove the burden of health insurance from the employers, which would lower the relative cost of labor, which would also lower the budget deficit by spending less money per person. Why is that not being addressed? Thank you. So the question briefly was whether socializing health care would reduce the labor costs in ways that could help address the unemployment problem. Are, would any of our panelists like to? <laughs> That was yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that is a, uh, that is an intriguing uh, uh, notion. I think uh, we ought to try to do, deal with it analytically. I mean, the, pro the problem is politically, uh, it's it's dynamite. And by the time you, politically and societally, you could settle the issue of whether you should nationalize it. A lot of time would pass. So, uh, on an analytical basis, um, there's a there is a, uh, first of all, the issue is you put your finger on a huge issue. If, if we were able to get the health care right to deliver more health care goods and services to more people at a, in a cost efficient way and to get the rate of health care inflation down, I think that could do more for our macro economy than the end of the Cold War ultimately did for us. But I don't see that that's happening in Washington and what, what, what we're getting out of that. 
so, so nationalization, though, remember what you're saying. You're saying the government does it all, runs it, and you really are kind of saying they're going to set the prices. And as economists, we would probably tend to say we like to see the price mechanism work. So, so part of my reaction is I think what's wrong with what they're doing in Washington now is that the price mechanism isn't working because the end user doesn't know how much doctors or individuals, how much they're paying. And so the costs just keep on running higher and higher. And it, so it's, I think it's not being considered for political reasons, not because it's not analytically something worth thinking about. Thank you. Any of the other panelists like to weigh in? Well, I'll, I'll just add that it's a very, very complicated issue, as, as Alan was just saying. But the issue, it's, you know, do, would you rather, you know, sort of go to the DMV or would you rather get on Facebook or Twitter in terms of efficiency? So you have to be very, very careful there when you, when you have something where there's no competition, it's a single government option. The issue with health care is it's, if the vast majority of money is being spent in the last six months of, of people's lives, it becomes very difficult to say, right, as an economist and sort of at, at the margin, don't spend that money on this particular thing because, or this experimental technology. It's not an issue for you, fortunately yet, it's not an issue for me, but in 20 years for me, it will be, and that's a tough one. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're going to um, shift gears. That is certainly an important point, and we've had some responses from the panelists. Are there additional uh, questions or, or comments that people would like to make? Yes. Can you speak a little louder, please? So the question was if panelists could comment on the new consumer protection legislation in terms of uh, usurping the power of the Fed. Uh, well, it's not a question of usurping power. It's uh, sort of where the um, best, best use of that regulatory authority might lie. Currently, the Federal Reserve has responsibility for uh, rule writing, but also supervision of financial institutions, depository institutions, uh, to make sure that they are complying with the consumer regulations, and we find it useful in our monetary policy making role to have a pretty good window into financial institutions through our supervisory activities. We have found, we, we argue that our supervisory effectiveness is stronger when we have this additional responsibility when we're looking at the consumer compliance aspects because we think that there are synergies in looking at the safety and soundness of those institutions. But it's certainly a controversial uh, issue, and um, it's occupying a lot of Congress's time. We'll see how it comes out. Perhaps I could, uh, could ask a question. The uh, panelists all seem to be um, optimistic in some ways, although talking about how long a recovery might take and how slow it might be, but um, we didn't hear much discussion of what remaining tools there may be if, in fact, we were to have more of a W type of, of uh, behavior. Um, so if we were to find out that uh, actually we got some bad news and things started turning down again, um, what additional space is there for policy to actually weigh in and make a difference? Why don't I take that? Uh, I, I, th I think actually options are, are, kind of, are kind of limited. So there's a lot less headroom uh, uh, than we had going into this crisis. Uh, the, there's, there is a limit on how much we can borrow to stimulate the economy. So, so one reason why, why we've, been to ha we've been able to have this very aggressive and appropriately so, in my view, fiscal policy is that uh, the federal government is currently able to borrow at 3 or 4% uh, for 20 or 30 years. Uh, that we, we, there's still more capacity there, uh, but it's not unlimited. So uh, I think it would be the option, the choices would be much more difficult if we had a, had a second out, downturn. I, and I, I think if we did, 
you'd want to target uh, target the policies on uh, on uh, essentially on the price side. That's the sort of thing that Alan was talking about, where if if in a second if you had if you needed a second round of stimulus, which I don't I don't really don't think you should be looking at now, but nothing wrong with contingency planning, you'd want to do things that, which would reduce the cost of, of hiring workers, which, which could involve something like a Social Security tax holiday. The other thing I would do, uh, more as a precautionary measure, is uh, build up an inventory of infrastructure projects. So some of the, one of the most effective ways to stimulate the economy is to do good public works projects uh, that are worthwhile to have, uh, and they also are, are quite effective in the short run for stimulating uh, the economy. Uh, uh, the, when, when the administration uh, looked for, asked the governors uh, when it was coming into office, give us your list of projects, it only came up with about $100 billion per year's worth of projects and, and quite appropriately only put that amount into the stimulus package and the rest of the stimulus had other forms. Uh, it would be good to have an inventory of, of bridges that need to be built, uh, schools that need to be renovated, have them online, have blueprints ready uh, and uh, I think one good policy that we should be thinking about now would be to build, build some of these up in, in, in case we do get a double dip. So these projects could go online, say, in, in uh, 2011 or 2012. Alan? Uh, I'm kind of going to work backwards today. And, and this is a question that you have to answer later, which is why is it so many economists want to have an inventory of infrastructure and have the government spend money on in infrastructure? Uh, because my problem is, once you get one of those projects done, I guess they could go on forever, but when, I guess you could think of things forever to spend government money on, but once you get one of those done, and if nothing else is happening in the private sector economy, it's, it's all over. You just have to do it again, and that means more deficits, more debt, and because uh, you have to finance it. If you finance it by raising taxes, then that's depressing on the economy. Anyway, in response to your uh, question. I think there's a lot on the fiscal side. The, Charlie can answer if there's anything left on the monetary side. <laughs> he may have to think a while about that, but I'm just kidding, Charlie. I think there's a lot on the monetary side. But on the fiscal side, there is a lot. You have to find ways to pay for the additional spending. There are, uh, say, in the House Democratic uh, Congress now, they're thinking of pay for it. One of them is carried interest to eliminate that. There's a fair number of billions of dollars. That's a loophole in the tax law. Uh, I, I floated yesterday, others have floated it, transactions tax. Peter, you might not like that, but transaction tax uh, could raise a, a lot of money. Uh, carbon, which is dead in Congress now, the carbon uh, tax had revenues, extra revenues associated with it. You then take those and decide where those monies would go. Uh, and I would, rather than see them go in infrastructure, because so far I'm not seeing much from the $787 billion spending part of the program. It, it may come, but I'm not seeing much now. Uh, uh, I would rather see it go for tax cuts, to use those monies for taxes. And I think there's a lot of room for fiscal policy to provide some stimulus if we have another double dip. I, I, uh, for once, I can, I can disagree. One more two-hander, and then we'll okay. go back. Uh, the, the advantage of having an inventory of infrastructure projects or other, other useful government projects is they essentially have no permanent tax burden. If these are things that you would do in a couple of years, doing them a little earlier for macroeconomic reasons basically doesn't add to the permanent budget deficit, but it can stimulate the economy now. And so, so that, that's why I think they're so attractive. You just don't think they're worth it. No. Yes. Uh, maybe it's too late now that uh, two, two comments Thank you. 
flag for 25 years. And I live in Cincinnati, people who work for Bruce and Crocker and Gamble, they don't want to touch that gun until they have it. They might never make it go off guard. So the question was, uh, may, while it may be too late given what's happened to uh, retirement account wealth, um, why was there not more consideration to various kinds of tax holidays and other measures that might have made those retirement accounts more accessible for consumption? It would increase revenue to the government, and it would uh, it certainly increase shopping on the consumption, I believe. Maybe not the shopping that would have been seven years ago. Any comments from the panelists? Well, first of all, deferred compensation is a risk, right? If you ask people at a number of firms that, that went out of business and a lot of executives held deferred compensation, that was gone. So that's the reason why it's not taxed is that it's, there's risk to it. The notion of, of how we handle retirement, and I think it's an apropos question, is very important, right? The biggest government decisions over the last uh, 30 years since the 70s have been putting more decisions on individuals relative to the government going back to, to that. And I think that that's probably been a good thing. And we have to be very, very careful not to, we've had tremendous growth in wealth and assets even where we are today from 1982 to 2007. The beauty of capitalism, of course, is that every good idea gets driven into the ground like a tomato stick. You know, you just bang it till it's dead. So do we need to make some changes at the margin, as people mentioned, in terms of regulation and policy? Absolutely. But should we unwind everything and go back, and that's a concern to me, some of the policies that are floating right now, including the Consumer Protection Agency, where we want to put more emphasis off the individual and onto the government and expect the same results and expect to see the same wealth creation, expect to see the same innovation, I would disagree. I don't think that that's possible. So your idea of dealing at the margin with some of these issues and encouraging people to save and for retirement is an excellent idea, whether that's the right approach or what the tax rate is. Of course, I'm in favor of taxing everything that I don't use. Right, so I don't smoke, I trade. So transaction tax is terrible. Tax on cigarettes is outstanding. And that's, <laughs> that is the political dilemma right there. See, that's why we want to tax you, because you sit in front of that green screen, and we're not sure you make anything that means anything. Oh, my wait, goodness. Wait, 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 wait. I, I just I, want to say that I invest, I, I spend a lot, I'm an investor, I'm a small owner of Twitter, okay? So I invest in a lot of, different things in addition to uh, trading a lot of futures. There's a question back in the back there. Yes. Ben, regarding to your point now, China is leading the recovery. My question is, if the next depression might be at some, somebody in the, in the uh, Wall Street auction, might be China, because U.S. 's so the question is as China integrates further into the global economy, are there things that could be done now to make it less likely or to prevent um, a major recession initiating in China <laughs> this one is called it's sort of stump, stump the we'll Exit. Get a <laughs> stump, stump the Exit. By the way, your idea is a very good one uh, to stimulate consumption. I think empirically it isn't a big deal. Uh, it's a little bit like repatriates and funds. A lot of funds sit unused because people, corporations don't want to pay the tax on it. They're overseas. So the government doesn't get the tax money. It's not taxed because it sits overseas. And the funds aren't used by business in the United States to spend on things in the United States. Uh, the Senate turned down uh, a, a bill uh, last fall because the companies didn't really use the money to hire and they were angry about the last time they did this. But IRA is something like that. It's actually a good idea in the context of what's happened to consumption. Um, to the extent I can, I'll carry it 
and throw it down into the lap of the Congress down in. Uh, China at the moment is a major force for the global upturn. And so your concern, which is probably longer run, that is countries get going, they have long booms, and then the booms have bubbles and busts. Chinese stock market might end up in a bubble someday. We don't think it is now. But right now, without the Chinese fiscal stimulus and the upturn in Chinese economic growth and the effects on Asia, and then those effects as they rever reverberate through trade around the world and back even on the United States, the third largest economy in the world, that's China, uh, is, is a major positive force from a macroeconomic point of view. Your concern for the long run is well taken because the kind of thing you're pointing to happens all the time. Financial crises, booms, bubbles, busts, we just went through that in the United States. Japan went through it before, the US went through it in the 30s. And yeah, but I think it's a, a long way off. It could be China 20, 30 years from now. So I don't think anybody is gonna do anything about that worry right now. One of the big issues for policymakers, this is actually was a question for Charlie, is in a forward-looking way, policymakers to avoid the next crisis and thing that goes wrong, one of your colleagues made a very interesting speech and comment, that's Kevin Warsh, a few weeks ago, in which he, let's forget what he said about interest rates, maybe having to take them up sooner. Well, he was in Chicago when he said that. When he said that, at yeah. probably your conference, I think that was. I introduced him, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and, 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 and you didn't clear the speech before. <laughs> I don't clear mine with him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but what was interesting to me was his comment about watching, and, and, and it flows into your comments about inflation expectations. Uh, watching certain non-traditional indicators like market prices, asset prices, and as, as providers of information, I think he meant in terms of inflation expectations of a certain segment of the world, uh, and whether those kinds of indicators should be watched more as early signals of potential inflation fed by inflation expectations. I don't understand the mechanism, by the way, but along with the other indicators that the Fed uses. So I think it's a fair question for you because it's not about interest rates, it's more analytical. Well, I think he's talking about market indicators. For example, the, the ones that come to my mind are gold, the dollar, okay. uh, commodity prices. Commodity prices, okay. And, and, and you know, back of that is, here's another question for you. He, he, he asked two questions for the price of one. But the, the other question is, the question I get all the time after I give a talk, no matter how grim it is, to senior level executives or senior level financial people. The first or second thing they ask me is, it's all about runaway inflation. When, when is inflation going? And I don't understand. I say, what makes you think that? Look at the world out there. And, and they, all, they all ask that. So there's something going on in the inflation expectations mentality. And Kevin's comment seemed to me to be, we want to watch that in terms of inflation expectations so as not to be blindsided. And I wonder what's your reaction is to um, that. So, so I've experienced that type of uh, response too, in, in, in the sense that, and that's one reason why I tried to make the comments that I did. I mean, I went to, um, I went to an event uh, in, in London, and I talked to a number of people in uh, financial markets, and it was as if I was walking down a hallway. I would go into a room, I'd have a conversation, and all of the questions were, "My gosh." And, you know, deflation is coming. Look at all the resource lack. Look at all the problems. There's a worldwide slowdown. This was this summer. Um, aren't, aren't you worried about that, et cetera, et cetera? Finish the meeting. Go down the hall to the next room. Gee, look at all these inflationary pressures. I mean, you know, we're going to have a hyperinflation if this keeps going on. Look at commodity prices. Look at your balance sheet. And any combination in between, it's... Uh, the most variable period in terms of people's expectation, people's assessment of inflation and policy that I can remember in the time that I've been looking, not nearly as long as, as yours, but... Uh, <laughs> that's respect for our elders. That's what absolutely. <laughs> I have your wealth of experience. But the, the I think I tried to get a job with your firm at one time. <laughs> the, <laughs> none of those recessions. <laughs> now, now I'm sending my grandchildren to the Federal Reserve of Chicago. The, the inflationary <laughs> expectation goes into your China question, right? In the history of man, we've never run out of anything, right? That's a good thing. The cure for high prices is high prices. The question of a policy mistake takes place when there's a perceived permanent shift 
in, in something relative to supply. So if you believe, as I do, that the dynamic is such that technological progress in production of commodities, right, in oil, I guarantee you if the price of oil gets high enough, we'll, we'll drill for natural gas right here. Michigan will do it in a heartbeat. Is that the demand that's coming in the short run, so supply is relatively inelastic of a lot of these commodities. You're seeing an increase in demand through the stimulus and the development of coming online of all the different China, Brazil, that's a great thing, right? World growth is good. It causes short-run supply shocks, which raises prices. But the underlying uh, deflationary pressures are still there, and technology increases. So you've seen this repeatedly. We c I can replay this newspaper articles from 1973, 1979, 1988, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the biggest issue as far as China goes that we do is to make sure that we don't make the policy mistake that thinking that inflationary pressures are a result of a increase in demand of more global growth, which is a good thing, relative to the fact that supply is short run and elastic and technology and our productivity will increase. I'm, I'm very bullish on that. And if anybody's invested in the stock market and your long technology stocks, you have to believe that as well. Otherwise, you have a conflict in your mind and you've got to resolve that. Why don't we take one last question? Yes. So there is, um, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, awareness, vigilance, concern about commercial real estate and commercial mortgage-backed <laughs> securities. Um, just earlier this year when the Federal Reserve, along with the OCC and other regulators, did the supervisory capital assessment program for the 19 largest bank holding companies, that, that exercise was meant to look at the banks and see where their risks were, where the systemic risks might be to um, the financial system and get an assessment as to whether or not they had enough capital to weather the coming losses that were likely coming due on their balance sheet over the next uh, three years. And to make sure that they had enough capital to weather this over a, a, a two year period. So commercial real estate was an important aspect of that. Obviously vacancies are up, house up, property values are down, and that's a, a huge challenge. That's a large challenge for um, community and, and regional banks, really, because the way the banking system has sort of carved up the various uh, investment opportunities, the large banks do the capital market type of investments and securities and big deals, and the community banks are left more with the high touch uh, business investment, uh, consumer type of opportunity. So they often have portfolios which are, um, as we look at them, they're concentrated in commercial real estate more than uh, we would hope and given the current situation. Coming out of the SCAP, we, you know, I was surprised that the uh, financial system didn't need as much capital as I might have guessed going into it. That seemed to be pretty manageable. We're now taking the lessons that we've learned from that in looking at bank portfolios, and, and, and we're looking at it very carefully. But it is certainly the case that a lot of financial institutions have loans on their books that are, um, you know, have, have lost a lot, and it's going to be a problem for them. And so we have to make sure that, you know, those banks are as safe and sound as possible and that we handle that situation appropriately um, and also allow for uh, lending capacity to be as strong as it possibly can for everybody else who's in a better situation. I just think you asked the ultimate game theory question, right, which is Bank X is going to lend to refinance the debt of Bank Y, or is the Fed going to have to step in? I don't know the answer to that. I'll leave it to Joe. But that, that is the game theory. It's, it's way above my pay grade, but it's a very <laughs> important question. Any last thoughts from our two other panelists? Well, um, we do have a reception to follow, and so we can continue some discussion informally. But with that, please join me in thanking our four panelists for their insights. What, what I don't, on the inflation expectation side, yeah.